Thank the Lord, thank the Lord, thank the Lord, thank the Lord. Let's all stand right now. I know it's a little early, but I think a great way to go into service tonight would be to go in by prayer. And uh, we've got a great number that are over at the youth camp tonight. So I'm just going to start early here this evening. And if you'd like to join me up around the altar, if you'd like to just make your pew and altar there, that'll be great. Let's all just gather up and have a good season of prayer before church starts. Precious God of heaven, Lord, we give you praise and we give you glory and we give you honor. Lord, there is none like you in the heaven above or the earth. Lord, we come before you tonight in this holy house. Lord, we have come to give your name the praise and we've come, God, to give your name the glory tonight. Lord, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come and worship. And Lord, I thank you tonight for your presence that will meet us here. God, as we begin to lift up your holy name, as we begin to worship you, Lord. Lord, through song and through music, God, as we lift up our praises to you tonight. Oh, mighty God, we give you praise. Mighty God, we give you glory tonight. Lord, we use, God, we use, Lord, the breath that's in our body. We use, Lord, our mind to articulate praise to you tonight. Lord, I praise your name. I worship your name. I glorify your name tonight, Lord. You are great and you are greatly to be praised. Oh, let's just love the Lord right now together as a church. Oh, let's just lift our voices up in praise and adoration. We've got so much to be thankful for tonight. We, we've got so much to worship the Lord for tonight. We've got so much to magnify Him for tonight. We've got so much that we should just say, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Savior. Thank you, mighty God. Lord, you are our heavenly Father. Oh, you are our heavenly Father, and hallowed be thy name. Lord, we thank you, God, for what you've already done. Lord, thank you tonight that you brought us out of darkness. Thank you tonight, Lord, that you brought us out of bondage. Thank you tonight, Lord, that when our eyes were dark and blind in this world, that, Lord, you visited us by your great spirit. And, Lord, you let somebody find us with the gospel. And, Lord, we thank you for it tonight, Lord. I pray over this service. Lord, I pray over this service tonight. I pray over all of our musicians. Lord, I pray over our praise team tonight that you would anoint their minds, anoint their hands. Lord, we give you that praise tonight, Lord. We give you that praise. Lord, as we've gathered, Father, we pray for our youth that's at Strong Tower Camp tonight. Lord, we pray, God, that you would continue to touch the hearts of our sons and our daughters, our grandchildren tonight. Lord, I ask you, Lord, to move upon the service, God, there in Mars Hill. I ask you, Lord, to be upon that place tonight. God, anoint, Lord, the man of God. Anoint everything that is said and done. Lord, those young people, Lord, whose minds, God, are so, are so open, I pray that you would just move upon them tonight. God, you would touch them tonight, Lord, with your spirit. Lord Jesus, we love you tonight. Lord, we love you and we praise you tonight. God, we bring our needs before you right now. If you have a need right now, just lift your hand up before the Lord. You have a need in this house, just lift your hand up right now in the presence of God. Lord, you know our needs tonight, Lord. You know, God, exactly what we have need of. Lord, you see every hand that is lifted tonight. You know every request, Lord. God, and you not only know these requests, but Lord, you're able to answer them, God, according to your perfect will. Lord, we just ask you tonight, Lord, you know the needs. God, you know the needs in this local body. Lord, you know the needs, oh God, in this local church. 
Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, God, be upon those, Lord. God, be upon Sister Linda Thompson tonight. God, move and touch her, God. Lord, we know that you're the healer of our bodies. We know that there's nothing, Lord, that you can't do. Lord, we just ask you tonight, Father, to minister to Sister Thompson in her body, in her soul, in her spirit. God, let your presence, Lord, be ever felt in her mind. Let your presence, God, be ever felt throughout her body. Lord, I ask you tonight, Lord, to touch Charity Yates. God, that your hand would be upon Charity Yates tonight. Lord, that you would heal, God, that you would touch, Lord. God, you are the Savior, Lord. You are our Savior. God, I ask you tonight to touch Sister Patterson's stepfather, Bill. God, who received the news today of stage four cancer. Lord, I pray over Bill right now, Lord, that you would touch. I pray tonight, God, that you would move upon his body tonight. You would move there, God, in that hospital room, Lord. God, that you would touch, Lord, in a great and a mighty way. Lord, you are the God that's drawn to suffering. Lord, you are the God that is drawn, Lord, to suffering, Lord. Lord, all the suffering people, Lord, that may be in this room tonight, God, the suffering people that may be watching online tonight, Heavenly Father, would you walk the aisles of this church, God? Lord, would you walk up and down the aisles of this church tonight? Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Lord, our eyes are upon you. Our minds are upon you, Lord. God, you said in your word that when the enemy comes in like a flood, that the Spirit of God would raise up a standard against him. Lord, our eyes are upon you tonight, Lord. We look unto our, the hills from which cometh our help. Our help comes from you, Lord. Father, be upon this service tonight. Lord, move upon every aspect of this service right now. God, we have come to give you praise. We have come to give you glory. Lord, I ask all of these things in the mighty, matchless name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen and amen. Let's worship the Lord tonight in this place. Let's give him some praise tonight in this house. God, you are great and you are greatly to be prayed. Well, let's lift our hands toward heaven. Let's invite God's presence in this place. He's already here. But let's make him feel welcome. Thank you, Jesus. Let's search for you.
praise Him right now. Well, He'll turn your grave into a garden. He'll turn your sea into a highway because that's our God. Oh, let's praise Him, church. He is worthy. He is worthy to be praised. We bless your holy name, Jesus. We bless your holy name, Jesus. Oh, blessed Lord, blessed Lord, you're worthy, Jesus. Blessed Jesus. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days have been held in 
goodness, come on. His goodness follows us every day. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. You just trust in Your God. Goodness is running after. His goodness is going to run after you. He's going to find you right where you're at. him a praise right now. If God's been good to you, give him some praise right now in this house. Oh, magnify his name because God is good. God is good. God is good. God is good. Oh, I thank you. Come on, give him a little bit more praise. I, I know that God has been so good to us tonight. Come on, reach way down and give him some praise. I know you've worked hard today. I, I know it's at the end of the day right now, but could we give him a sacrifice of praise tonight? Could we, is he worthy? Is he worthy of a sacrifice of praise tonight? Oh, has he been good to you? Has he been good to you tonight? Oh yes, he's been good to me. He's been good. If you remain standing with me, I want our ushers to make their way to the front at this time. He's been good to me. As a matter of fact, I am of the persuasion, and Brother uh, Tharp, I'll, uh, we'll publicly debate it right here tonight, but I am of the persuasion that he has been better to me than he has been to anybody else in this room tonight. I am of that, I'm of that persuasion. Oh, I Brother Naomi, put your hand down back. Hey, just put your hand down. I don't want to, I want to hear it tonight. I, I'm here to tell you something. God has been better to me when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me. My soul, my soul, my soul, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Oh, when I think about it. Oh, I got a good start with Jesus. I got a good start with Jesus. You see, before I ever gave my life to him, before I ever said yes to him, before I ever yielded a praise, before these two hands ever lifted in praise to his name, all my life, all my, my, my childhood memories, my childhood memories, I would just continually, my ear, I had an earache, and I can remember in that day how we'd go to sleep sometime would be to put a, a towel in the oven and that was back before microwaves, or let me say this, back before poor people could afford microwaves. And I'd heat that, they'd heat, mama would heat that towel up just hot enough, and 
I would lay down on that, that warm towel and bring a little relief. Wake up in the morning, there would be all kind of uh, infection that had drained from my ear. And mother took me to a doctor. He did an examination on my ear. And he said, this young man has got a ruptured eardrum. He said, the hole is so gaped. He said, it tries to heal up, but it opens back up. He said, I'll have to do a skin graft. And I'll have to take some skin and, and graft around the eardrum. And I remember it like it was yesterday. We left that doctor's office with some prescriptions of antibiotics to clear up the infection so the surgery could be performed. Mother took me by First Apostolic Church in Knoxville and uh, Pastor McCool, Pastor Bishop McCool anointed me with oil and prayed over me. I didn't know to call out on the Lord. I probably didn't raise my hands that day other than was respectful, respectful to the man of God and just allowed him to pray for me. A few weeks later, a few weeks later, we go back to that same doctor. He sticks that big machine in my ear, my left ear. He sticks it in there, and he looks around a little bit. He looks at his chart. He takes the machine. Mother Lee takes the machine out of my, this ear and brings the whole, rolls it around to this ear. And then he looks at the chart, and he keeps going back and forth. And finally, he just said, well, I knew those antibiotics were powerful but I didn't know how powerful they were. Said that hole in his eardrum has sealed plumb up. Said it's sealed plumb up. Well, I'm here today, I'm not knocking modern medicine, but it wasn't his antibiotics that healed my ear. It was the mighty goodness of the almighty God that did that. Before I ever called on his name, if he's that good to us, what a good, what a good God we serve tonight. You see why some people are motivated by the fear of God, the judgment of God. And some people, when it comes to offering time, some people, when it comes to offering time, have to hear things such as somebody saying, you know, if you spend more on shotgun shells than you do, giving them the offering, shame on you. If you spend more on a can of dog food, then I, I've heard it all. A can of dog food, or if you, if, you give, if you give less than the offering tonight, then your belt card or your whatever. I, I've heard all of that. But you see, we don't give out of that. We're not motivated by shame or guilt. We're motivated by the... We're motivated by the goodness of God tonight. That's what motivates us to give in this offering. Father, I love you tonight. God, you've never left us and you never will leave us, Lord. God, I thank you for the privileged opportunity to give in this church tonight, to give God to your great work. God, you've been so good to us. I thank you for the health in my body. I thank you that you've given me the ability to earn an income, to feed, shelter, and clothe my family. I thank you, God, that you've given me the revelation through Scripture of the financial covenant partnership that we have through tithe and offerings, that, God, if we'll obey your word, you will open up the windows of heaven and you will pour out blessings that there shall not be room enough to receive. Lord, I thank you for all of those blessings tonight. Receive this offering as we give it cheerfully. In Jesus' name we pray. Give the Lord a hand of praise as you're being seated right now. We exalt Thee. We exalt Thee. We exalt Thee. Join our voices together. 
That's what we're here to do tonight. To praise nobody but you, Jesus. You're worthy of the highest praise that we can offer, so we we exalt your holy name. That name of Jesus that's above all other names. like what I feel. When I sing this, I like what I feel. Come on, church, lift up those voices. We tonight. chapter 17 and verse number one and I'd like to welcome some very honored special guests with us tonight brother and sister Anders from the great state of Mississippi we're so glad we're so glad to have you all here with us tonight 
and they are here celebrating an anniversary, and we are so glad to have them in the house of the Lord. Are you glad to have the Anders with us tonight? Man of God and his precious wife from Mississippi, and I look forward to fellowshipping with you for a few moments after service. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Now, this, uh, this announcement, um, I, don't have, I don't have a problem announcing this, this announcement. It's the other one that I have the problem with. But this coming Sunday, we're going to be honoring Sister Carpenter, First Lady. Her birthday is July the 4th, and we're going to be honoring her with a, a birthday offering on this coming Sunday. So be prepared to bless, uh, to bless uh, First, First Lady. And she's doing an awesome job. Uh, I, um, I, I, I can tell you she's doing an awesome job. She is the... She's the wind in my sails. She's the wind in my sail. And uh, I, I told her the other day, I told her the other day, she said she didn't really want me to talk about it. I thought it was good. I, I said, you know, she's such a problem solver. She's such a problem solver. She could solve problems. And, and uh, I, I said, uh, I said, if I go before you, if, I, or if you go before I go, let me get it straight. If, I, if you go before I go, I said, I've already got the text uh, for, your, for your memorial service. Well, she didn't like that at all. All right. It just, you know, who wants to hear about the text you got rid of? But they had a problem in the Bible. They had a problem. They brought a problem to Jesus. They said, uh, who do we render tribute to? And he simply, he simply asked him a question. He just simply said, show me a penny. All right. I said, Penny, even Jesus was using you way back in the Bible. Show me, show me. Well, I don't know if I use that one or not. Anyway, let's, let's, go, let's go to Acts chapter 17, verse number 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Ap Ap Apollonia, I've been practicing on those, they came to Thessalonica where was a synagogue of the Jews. I want to minister tonight and just keep your Bibles open there because we're going to go through this 17th chapter. But I want to minister tonight on stirred up saints. All right? Stirred up saints. Isn't it wonderful how relevant our Bible is? Isn't it wonderful how relevant our Bible is? That whatever you can be going through, you can start reading and all of a sudden it's not like, Boom, there it is. It's, wow, I can relate to that. I'm so glad for this word tonight. Father, I thank you for your word, the lamp and the light. I thank you for your word, God. I thank you for the honey, God. I thank you, Lord, for the honey, God, that is in your word tonight. I thank you for this group of people, God, that have come to study your word on this Wednesday evening. Lord, allow me and anoint me, God, to minister your word. I'll give you praise and honor. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray, amen and amen. You may be seated. This history that is recorded in the book of Acts, this Luke, the recorder, the one that wrote the book of Acts, is writing of the history and the ministry and the traveling of the apostle Paul. Verse number one, he tells about a city that Paul came to. And then at the end of verse number one of chapter 17, he says, <clears throat> where was a synagogue of the Jews? In other words, Paul had landed Brazil, to a place, it had a synagogue. We would, we would know it as a, as a church. Verse 2, and Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbaths reasoned with them out of the Scripture. Now, as his manner was, I am so glad to be in the habit of going to church. That's what that means there. As his manner was, or as his habit was, he went into the synagogue, he stayed three weeks, three Sabbaths, and he reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Verse 3, opening and alleging, that Christ must have suffered 
and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Now, he went into those synagogues, those places of worship, and he began to open up the scriptures, and he began to prove through the Old Testament scriptures that this Jesus, who had recently been crucified and recently rose from the dead and ascended up into heaven, he is, he is teaching them through Moses that this is, that this is the Christ. Verse 4, and some of them believed, and some of them believed, and consorted, that word there means to keep company with, and consorted with Paul and Silas, and the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. Now, this, this, this is, a, this is a, a sizable revival going on. This is a sizable, well, it's not a revival. Let's, let's get the Bible terminology correct here. Um, it's not a revival because something had to be alive for it to be revived. And so these people have never had spiritual lives. So this is, this is a harvest. This is someone that Paul is planting the Word of God. He is sowing the seeds of the Word of God. And these people begin to believe him. Now, please notice with me in verse number 4, it says, And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. And of the devout Greeks... A great multitude. So now, some believed, and then it went into the devout Greeks. It went into the, to the devout Greeks. And when it goes into there, it says a great multitude. So this is a great number. This is a great number of people. And then it even goes on and adds, and of the chief women, not a few. In other words, there were some very notable women in this, in this area, and they believe the gospel. They believe what Paul said, and, and they believe. So there's a great multitude, and uh, there, are, there, there, are some, there are some of the, that believe and consorted with Paul. So this is a great revival. Is, oh, excuse me. This is a great harvest, isn't it? This is a great harvest. We like harvest around here, don't we? We, 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 love, we love the fact that people get baptized on a regular basis around here, don't we? We love the fact that people get the Holy Ghost on a regular basis around here, right? We love the fact that we have guests come. About every service, we'll have guests come, and we've got interest of people wanting to know about, wanting to know about the apostolic gospel doctrine. We like that, don't we, church? Certainly we do. Verse number five. But the Jews... Which believe not. Now, the Bible said some believe. But what about the ones that believe not? They are not content just to simply not believe. But the Jews which believe not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason. That's where Paul was allowed to stay. That's where Paul was allowed to lodge, the house of, of Jason. And assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out unto the people. Now, 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 now look at the, 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 the scenery here. We have a great harvest. We have some that believe. We have a multitude of devout Greeks that believe. We have not a few of the chief women that believe and obey the gospel. But it seems like that the party that didn't want to believe were not content with just not believing what Paul said. They had to turn around and be motivated, be motivated to try to destroy those that believed and the revival. As a matter of fact, they come and the Bible says, look at verse number five, they assaulted the house of Jason. Now, now look at this. Let's go back and read verse five again. Here's the motivation. But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. They, 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 they took, they took, 
people that were lewd. They took people that 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 were that were this word lewd means vulgar. All right. They took the baser. They took the they took the baser of the people, and they they ignited them against the house of Jason, against where the word was being, where Paul had lodged, and they come against, and look at the word there in verse five, they assaulted the house of Jason and brought and, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, these that have turned the world upside down have come hither also. Now, now look at their charge. Look at their charge. They have turned the world, they have turned the world upside down. What a crime. What a crime. To turn the world upside down, which I'm going to tell you, the world got turned upside down with sin. The blessed gospel of Jesus Christ will turn the world right side up. They've turned the world upside down, whom, verse 7, whom Jason, he's received. And these all do contrary to, de to the degrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. Now, I want you to know that Jesus Christ, neither any of the apostles, preached a revolt against the government. None of them did. Jesus Christ said, who should you pay tribute to? They said, bring me a penny. He said, whose inscription's on that coin? They said, Caesar. Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God. They did not preach revolting against their government. Jesus didn't nor any of the apostles preach any such. But look at how these lewd people of the baser source has to bring a slanderous report, a half-truth, and it's not even, this is not even a half-truth here. It, it's, and I've always said a half-truth is always a whole lie. And it says, verse 7, whom Jason hath received, these all do contrary to the degrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and the other, they let them go. Now, I put these words together tonight, stirred up saints. But really, I just need two words tonight, saints and stirred. Because if you ever have a church, you'll have a stirred up devil. It is impossible to be the church without having a stirred up devil. So let's not think it's strange when we're being the church that there would be a stirred up devil. Now, what we're not going to do is call a truce with the devil. We're not going to call a truce with him. We're going to preach truth. We're going to preach holiness. We're going to be the people that God has called us to be. Because let me tell you something. Hell can't win and heaven can't lose. So let's don't think it's strange. You got, you got this being stirred. You got this being stirred up. Well, let's continue. Verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. They, they, they said, listen, y'all better move out of here, move out of here. And they go down to this city called Berea. And what do they do? They keep doing what they've always done. They go into the synagogue. Verse 11. These Bereans... These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They were, they were better men than the people Paul had left in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily 
whether those things were so. Now these Bereans, that's a good group to be among because they were studying the scripture to see what the scriptures had to say. Verse 12. Therefore, many of them, what? Come on, help me tonight now. Many of them, what? Believe. Believe. Also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. Boy, here's another good harvest. See, we, we, if we'll just keep doing what God's called us to do, church, we'll keep getting what God wants, and that, that's, a, that's a harvest. So Paul said, hey, if Thessalonica don't want this, and they caused an uproar, we got down here to Berea, and here we've got, now we've got another, we've got another harvest on our hands. Look at verse 13. But when the Jews of Thessalonica, that's where they, that's, that's those folks got stirred up. When they of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached to Paul at Berea, they came thither also, and look what they did. Wherever God's moving, the devil's going to try to stir people up. Stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him to Athens. And receiving a commandment unto Silas and of Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now, now, let's just look at this journey here. You got Paul in Thessalonica, and he had a great harvest there, but it stirred up the devil. You got Paul at Berea. He had a great harvest there. Isn't it wonderful how relevant the Bible is? He had a great harvest there. What happened? Stirred up the devil. So they just kind of take him down to Athens. They take him down to Athens, and they're waiting for, they're waiting for Timotheus and Silas to meet Paul there. And as Paul is waiting, I want to divide this up for you tonight. Rome was the center of political power. Rome was where all the political power was. Corinth was where all the educational power. Corinth was the Greeks. It was where all the intellects were there. But Athens, Athens was the center of culture. It was the center of the blendings of different, different cultures. And so now Paul finds himself at, finds himself, excuse me, at Athens. Look at verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry wholly given to idolatry. Now, I did a little historic, uh, a little history research here. And there was a common saying about the city that Paul's in. There's a common saying. There was so full of idols. There was a common saying. There's more idols in Athens than men. There's more idols. You can find more idols there than men. And Paul, when he saw this city, when he saw, when he saw this city that was wholly given to idolatry, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. In other words, he wasn't just going to sit there in the midst of a city that was full of idolatry and not open his mouth. He was going to declare unto them the gospel. He was going to declare unto them the one true and living God. And can we all agree tonight, you'll never find satisfaction until you found Jesus. You will never find satisfaction, no, not in political power, 
not in education, and not even in man-made religion or culture. You will never find satisfaction. The only way to find satisfaction is through the born-again message. The only way to find satisfaction is through that relationship with Jesus Christ. So therefore, Paul went into the synagogue and he found any devout person that he could and in the marketplaces, anybody that would meet with him. Verse 18, then certain philosophers and Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? What will this babbler say? Other, some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Now, when he got the word out, again, Athens was a place of culture. It was the epicenter of culture, of the debating of ideas, of the debating of logic and philosophies. All of these things, these two groups of people here, the Epicureans and the Stoics, these were philosophers. And when they began to hear Paul, they said, um, look at verse 18. They weren't very kind to him, were they? They said, what does this babbler, what does this babbler say? That word there literally means word, word pecker, word pecker. It comes from woodpecker. That's right. In other words, what's this man beating his head up saying, oh, what's this, what's this word pecker doing? What, what's this woodpecker doing? Just pecker? That's how these philosophers seen Jesus Christ. That's our, excuse me, the apostle Paul. That's how they saw Jesus Christ. Apostle Paul, he, he's just somebody, he's just a babbler. Listen at him over there babbling, babbling. He seemed to be a center forth of some strange God because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Now, anytime you had to build or you wanted to introduce a new God, Brother Holland, anytime you wanted to, to present a new God, and I'm, I'm kind of adding this to help us put the pieces together. Anytime, anytime you wanted to present a new God and you wanted to present a new God so that you could get a permit to build a new idol. You could have a piece of ground on Mars Hill to have a new idol built. You had to stand before this almost like Senate. Um, verse 19 is where we, where we find this at. And they took him, Paul, and brought him unto the Apacus, saying... May we know what this new doctrine and whereof thou speaketh is. In other words, he had to stand before the Senate, the Senate of people, and he had to plead about this new God, this Jesus Christ and the resurrection. So now they take him and place him before this Senate. He stands there. In verse 20, they say, For thou bringeth certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but to either tell or to hear some new thing. That's what this whole council was all about, is if somebody had a new idea, they had a new philosophy, they had a new culture, they had a new way of living, they had a new way of gender identity, they had a new way of what morals were all about. This is where they stood. So they take Paul. And they said, this is a strange new God, this Jesus and the resurrection. This is a strange new God. Speak, Paul, verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, you men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. 
Now, this was really a way to open up with a compliment. He's really complimenting them. Because remember the saying of Athens, there's more statues, there's more idols in Athens than there are men. So Paul is standing in a place that there's just idols all over the place. Because remember, remember this fact, remember this fact. They believed that the gods always came down to the earth. They believed the gods came down to the earth. And so when Paul says... I perceive that you're too superstitious. He's really saying to them, I perceive that you all are hungry. I perceive that you're searching for something. I perceive there's a hunger. There's a hunger in, in your heart. And he says, he bases it on verse 23. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions or way of worship, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Now, this is this altar. They had got together there at their senate, and they had a God here and a God there and a God of war and a God of rain and a God of flowers. They had all these. Remember, there's more idols in, in Athens than there are men. And somewhere along the way, someone had the bright idea that there may be a God we don't know. There may be a God we've missed out. There may be, and somebody said, well, let's make an altar to the unknown God, and we'll go there to that God. We'll go to that altar, and we'll say, you know, we don't know what to name you. We don't know what to call you, but if we've left you out, we want to give you worship. If we've left you out, we want to give you, we want to give you flowers or whatever, whatever they would give. If we've let you, left you out, it's the altar of the unknown God, and Paul says, I saw this altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. I am going to present to you the unknown God. I am going to tell you about this unknown God. Verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needeth anything, seeth, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord if haply, or that's by chance, they might feel after him and find him, though he be not very far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Now, I'm going to stop there at verse 28. He begins to declare unto them the unknown God. And he declares that the unknown God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. I don't know what other statues and idols they had for creation. God of rain, God of harvest, God of this and God of that. But Paul wanted to start off by saying, the unknown God is the creator of heaven and earth. The unknown God is the creator of the sun and the moon and the stars. The unknown God is the God that created rain and clouds. The unknown God is the God that created vegetation to come out of the earth. The unknown God, not only did he create the earth, but this unknown God created all of us humans. We all come from Adam. We all come from the creator of this God. So he begins by saying this unknown God, this unknown God is the creator. He, 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 he tells them in verse number 25 that he is not worshiped with men's hands as though he needeth anything. Seeth he giveth to all life. That's verse 25. Verse 24, he said the God that made the world and all 
things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. What is he doing? What is he doing? He is showing them that they are serving the works of their hands. He said, this unknown God doesn't live in one of these temples you've built. This unknown God, all these statues that have to be painted on a yearly basis, all of these places that have to be kept up, and you're serving these idols. He says, the unknown God created heaven, and the unknown God created earth. He doesn't dwell. The unknown God doesn't dwell in any of these, any of these idols. And then, if you would go back to verse 27, he says that they should seek the Lord, that's the unknown God, if haply or by chance they might feel after him. That's, his, that's emotions. If you can feel after him and find him, though he be not very far from every one of us. In other words, he said, if you would just use your emotions, if you would just, if you would just use your energy that you use to build these idols, if you would just use, if you, if you would just use several, several years ago, several years ago, I lived beside a man. He's a precious man. He's a precious man. He was a good neighbor. He was a good neighbor. His religion was Hindu. His religion was Hindu. And so one day uh, he invited me into his home and he had, had a, 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 a room. It, w- it would have been a dining room, but in this room was little altars and poster boards and uh, a, little, a little altar area there. And, and uh, I, I asked, I asked could, could I step in there? And he simply asked if I would remove my shoes. And so I, I, I did, I removed my shoes and I stepped in and, and I saw dried fruit on this, this little altar area here. And I, I saw others and he was explaining to me the, the different needs. If he's got this need, he goes to this, this God. And if he's got that need, he goes to be thankful for life from this God. And then there was a, a and, and we both got a chuckle out of it. There was a poster board of a, a of a woman and she was decked out in all kinds of jewelry and, and she had her hands like this and coins were coming out of her hands and he told me this was the God of financial prosperity and he said I pray to her a lot I pray I pray quite a bit I pray quite a bit to her and so he, he was he was he was walking me he was walking me all 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 all, all around and, and, and as a matter as a matter of fact probably the only disagreement the only time he ever, he, he did, he did uh, uh, chide me one time, scolded me one time. Uh, scold would be the better word to use. I had an ant hill in my front yard, and uh, it was on my property, although our property's butted up. I had an ant hill there, and those ants, you ever, you, you know, don't ever try to mow an ant hill down. It's a wrong thing to do. You'll bear the marks on your ankles for a whole long time, all right? And so I decided just to pour gasoline on, on this ant hill here. And he was very upset because in his religion, that's not acceptable to do. And he began to, you know, to scold me. And, and, but anyway, uh, that, that's the part of the sermon. He just began to scold, scold me about it. But he was very emotional about his God. Can I tell you that what Paul is trying to tell these people at Athens, if you would show emotions to this one called Jesus Christ, if you would just feel after him, because he's not very far away from any of us. For in him we live and we move and we have our being. Can I tell you tonight, the Lord is not a thousand miles away from us. He's just one emotional gust of praise of, oh God, I love you and I thank you and I praise you. God, you have been so good to me. God, you have blessed me when I didn't deserve it, God. You have, come on, could we just do that right now? Could we just give a a gush of emotion? God, I just thank you tonight. Lord, I just praise you tonight, God. God, you've been better to me, Lord, than I've been to myself. Come on, keep it up right now. Just for a few more moments, he said, if we would just feel after him, we would just feel after him. He said, if you just put your emotions in this, verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets, your own prophets have said, we are, we, for we are also his offspring. Now, here's what he says. 
if your own poets, if, if the people that are your prophets say that human beings is the offspring of God, and I want you to follow this, even at Athens, their own prophets said that human beings were the offspring of God. Then what Paul says here, he says here, he says in verse 29, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone graven by art of man's device. He says, if we're the offspring of God, why are you building these buildings over here? You see, it's been said, God created man. God created man in his image and in his likeness. It's, it's in the scripture. God created man in his image and in his likeness. And then sin came. And then let me add this. Ever since sin came, man has been creating God in his image and in his likeness. We were first made in the image and the likeness of God, but sin has so warped our minds that man now says, let me show you this God. This is the God that I serve. This is the God, and it's all a part of their imagination. It's all a part of their philosophy. And so Paul is just waving. I, I can see Paul waving his hands at these temples, these columns, these statues, these works of art, and he's saying, if we are the image and the likeness of God, then... What are all these buildings? We ought not to think of the Godhead like silver, gold, stone, graven by art and man's device. Look at verse 30. At the times of this ignorance, God winked at. It was a time that God winked at that. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, to change their mind, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Now look where he starts. He starts with God being our creator, with God becoming a man, the man Christ Jesus. And he goes all the way to the end of the world. The world's going to be judged by Jesus Christ. There is a judgment day. I know some people live like there's never going to be a judgment day. But you've got you to understand there will be a judgment day. Paul spoke of the resurrection. Now watch this. Verse 31, he talked about he is appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by, the, by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. What is our assurance? The resurrection. The resurrection is proof positive that Jesus Christ was who he said he was, God manifested in the flesh. The resurrection, the empty tomb, the empty tomb is the, greatest, is the greatest assurance a believer has. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I, I guarantee you none of us have ever faced anything like what Jesus Christ faced. But he faced the cross. He faced death, hell, and the grave and came forth victorious. And because he's victorious, we can be victorious tonight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Can you give him praise right now? But that's the gospel. That's the gospel. Verse 32, every man is over giving his own response. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, we will hear thee again. We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, which was Dionysimus, and um, that other place he's from right there, and a woman named Damaris. Look at the three. Would you just hold up three fingers? Would you just hold up three fingers? 
Three. Three. There's three responses to the gospel. There's three responses to the gospel. You can hold it in derision. You can hold it in derision. You can hold it in mockery. That's what derision means. Derision means to mock at something. Derision means to laugh at something. It means to look at it and laugh and mock at something. And when these so-called educated philosophers heard of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the dead, they laughed at it. They mocked at it. They scoffed at it. Can I tell you that it is in the DNA of the New Testament church for mockers. Ever since there has been a New Testament church, there has always been mockers around. If you are going to let mockers discourage you, you get ready to be discouraged. If you are going to let people that feel they're at a higher plane of, of learning and they're, they're just a little bit better than you because they, they don't have to lean on this crutch called the gospel, you just, you just might as well get ready to be discouraged. They were in the days of the Bible. They said nonsense. Isn't it in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse number 13, the Holy Ghost was poured out and there were some people there that said, what meaneth this? They were truly inquisitive. What meaneth this? We hear these men speak in our own tongues wherein we were born. And they were truly inquisitive. How, what, what meaneth this? But the Bible says in Acts 2, 13, and others mocking said these men are full of new wine. There will always be mockers in our world. There will always be those. It's their right to mock. God gave them the ability. God gave them the choice. They can hear with their ears and they can choose to believe with their heart or they can choose not to believe and they can choose to mock at it. But just because someone mocks at it does not diminish one iota of the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. You can mock at it. You can mock at it. You can scoff at it. You can mock at it. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, anytime God begins to move, you'll find mockers in the room. In the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, I'll go there very quickly. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, verse number 39. Jairus' daughter is laying a corpse in a room. She's died. Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up. In verse 39, cha verse 39 of chapter 5 of Mark. And when Jesus was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? What are you so upset about? Why are you crying? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. Look at verse 40. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel with him. Let me, let me just stop reading there. Can I tell you something? You'll never have God work in your life until you remove the mockers and the scoffers out of your life. As long as you keep a diet, I don't care how educated they claim to be, as long as you keep a diet of mockers and scoffers in your life, you are going to handicap the power of God in your life. It's time to put the mockers out. It's time to put the scoffers out of your life and let Jesus resurrect your dead. Can God do it? You better believe God can do it. He still is a miracle worker. He still is a problem solver. He still is the lame man healer. He still can do, come on now, exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can think and are ask. But can I tell you the old saying is, the old saying is to get the last laugh, right? He gets the last laugh. Let me take you to Proverbs chapter 1 for just a moment. Proverbs chapter 1. God identifies his wisdom. God identifies himself as wisdom. This is God in chapter 1 of Proverbs. Chapter 1 verse number 13. Listen to God. This is God. This is God. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 23. Excuse me. Proverbs 1 verse 23. 
Listen to God. This is God. Turn you at my God. God says, turn at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit upon you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called, God says, I have called, and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But you have set at naught all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. In other words, God says, I reached for you. I sent a preacher to you. I sent a message to you. But all you could do was scoff at it. All you could do is mock at it, and pick at it, and find fault out on it. He said, I reached for you. I reached for you. But listen to God. Listen to what God says in verse 26. This is what God says. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock you when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me but I will not answer. They shall seek me early. They shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own device. Now I know in this over-baptized grace and mercy uh, culture that we're in, we can't see God doing that. In this culture that all we hear about is a loving God that'll take you back any old way, and I do believe that God's love is beyond our comprehension, but I can't deny the fact that he said when I'm reaching for you and I'm trying to give you the word, if you set my word at naught and you mock at me and you mock at them that love me and you make fun of them that love me, he said, there's going to come a day that I, God, am going to get the last laugh. I'm going to laugh at you when your destruction comes. I'm going to close my ears to you when you cry out unto me. Now, I know that's a hard word tonight. And you know why it's a hard word? Because we have lived in a culture that has become obsessed with wanting to hear nothing but a God that'll be everything to me, but I don't have to have any responsibilities back to him. Whew. Boy, I just say one thing tonight. I am glad when I heard the gospel. I didn't come to him the first time he dealt with me. But I want you to know something right now. I can't answer for everybody in this room. But I never mocked him. I didn't serve him right away. But you look up here at this green-eyed preacher tonight. I never mocked him. I didn't serve him right away. But I never mocked him. The next people, the Bible says, the Bible says, let me get this, let me get this back. Verse 32 of Acts 17, verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we will hear thee again on this matter. It's called delay. It's called delay. See, I even believe tonight that there's people in this congregation tonight or people watching online that you're going to serve the Lord. You want to serve the Lord, but somehow you keep pushing the delay button. It's almost every time you hear the Holy Ghost begin to ring the alarm in your heart at church and you know you need to be baptized and you know you need to repent of your sins and you know you need to dedicate your life to God. You know you need to read your Bible. You know you need to come out and the Holy Ghost, he, he begins to, to sound off the alarm. We just simply seem to want to reach over and hit the delay button. Boom. Oh, I'm going to get baptized. Oh, I'm going to get the Holy Ghost. Oh, I'm going to get victory over this sin. Oh, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to really do that. These people here said they weren't mocking. They weren't mocking. They weren't mocking at what Paul said. They just simply said, hey, just not today. Just not today. We'd like to hear you again some other day. 
Now, I can tell you, and I believe we're all in this boat tonight. I did delay. I did delay. Not tonight. Not tonight. But I'm glad that there was finally a Sunday night or what, what night it was that I finally said, I've, I've hit this delay button my last time. I, I've hit this button my last time. I'm, I'm selling out. I'm, 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 going, I'm going for everything. I'm, I'm, I'm giving up this world. This world doesn't have anything to give you but heartache and misery. This world can't comfort you when your world falls apart. This world says, go get drunk. This world says, go get high. This world says, go buy something else. This world says, go get in another relationship. But it's only through Jesus Christ when your world falls apart that you can come to him and say, Lord, you said you'd never leave me. And then all of a sudden, you get grip when your insides are quivering, when your insides are quivering, but you've got enough emotions to say, Jesus, you split a Red Sea. Jesus, you kept them safe in the fire furnace. Jesus, you delivered Daniel. Jesus, you made a way through. All of a sudden, there's this incredible strength that just grinds you around, and I can live another day. I can worship another day. I can praise another day. Thank God. It wasn't a big city-wide revival. It wasn't a big city-wide revival. Just certain men one man is named and one woman is named out of that whole culture, okay? I'd like to say we'll see it. I'd like to say we'll see it. I sure wouldn't turn it, turn it away if it happened. But we're living in a culture that I believe that we could just keep reaching one here and one there and one here and one there. Paul got down there every place Paul went, every place Paul went because he was doing the right thing, he stirred up the devil. But every place Paul went, people heard the message and people were saved. Aren't you glad you said yes to the message? How many are, how many are thankful you received the message tonight? Do you, do you know how blessed you are that you received the message? Would you stand with me right now? How many are glad you received the message tonight? I'm so glad you received the message tonight. How many, when you were coming to God from the world, how many, I don't want you to call, don't, don't say their name out loud. Don't, don't, don't say their name out loud. But some of you were friends of mockers. Maybe some of you attended a revival service with your friends, with your friends. And your heart was under conviction. And you responded by saying, I receive it, Lord. I receive it, Lord. But your friends, they heard the same message. They fell under the same conviction. But instead of saying, I receive it, Lord, they begin to mock it. They begin to laugh at it. They begin to scoff. You know something about the mockers? They're not here tonight. I went to a revival service with my friends. My friends, my friends, I went to the revival service with them. When I got the Holy Ghost and got in church, I just knew that there were nights and things that, thank God the church had activity. Isn't that wonderful? Thank God the church had activity. How blessed we are to have a youth camp going on right now. Do you realize how blessed we are? M Mother Lee, 10 years ago when we rented that auditorium over at that college campus, when we rented it, said, it it'd probably seat a thousand, it'll probably seat a thousand in that auditorium. You know what the problem we had about 10 years ago? About 10 years ago, all we could fill up was about three or four pew, three, three or four, four rows, brother, brother in law in that place. Just, and we looked like a BB rolling down a four lane highway. I mean, we looked lost in that place. But 10 years ago, somebody prophesied. And somebody said, I'm going to fill this building with young people. And last night I looked around and I'm going to tell you, all we need is about 200 more and we're out of space over there.
I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's incredible what God... There's a big fountain out front in that, that university. We got permission. There's a big fountain. And youth leaders from all over the country, youth leaders are bringing their youth there. And, and, and on any night after service, you might find a youth leader rolling up his pants, getting in that fountain, and we're baptizing them in Jesus' name. Right, right there, right there in, in that place. Aren't you thankful we got activity for our children? You see, when I came to God, some of my friends didn't. I know what it's like, Sister Hurst, I know what it's like for the phone to ring at one o'clock in the morning and for my former friends to be singing in a mockery way, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Singing for the preacher boy now. Singing for the preacher boy now. And they'd hang it up. Can I tell you tonight, that I'm so glad that I didn't mock him. And I'm so glad that I stopped delaying. And I'm so thankful that I started believing in Jesus Christ and the resurrection. If you're thankful that you received him tonight, could we end this service with praise and honor from heartfelt saints of God? Oh God, I thank you tonight. Oh God, I magnify your name tonight. God, I praise you tonight, God. I give you glory. I give you honor tonight, Lord. You're my everything. You're my all in all tonight. Come on, church. Come on. There's a lot of noise can be made in this house right now. Come on. Just thank him that you received him. Thank him tonight that you received him. Thank him tonight that you received. I, I'm thankful, God, I said yes to you. I'm thankful, God, that I walked up into the baptistry and got baptized in your name. I'm thankful, God, that I carried until I received the Holy Ghost. I'm thankful that I kept on coming to church and I kept on hearing the word and my life is abundantly blessed tonight. Come on, church. Let's just love him right now. We have received God's word tonight. We praise him this evening. We magnify his name tonight. We glorify his name tonight. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. I'm glad I said yes to you, Lord. I'm glad that I said yes to you, God. Oh, God, I'm glad I received you in my life. Lord, since you came into my life, Jesus, everything has changed. Lord, since you came into my life, I don't feel like trash. I feel like treasure. Since you came into my life, I don't feel like I don't have any hope, but I feel like I have hope. Since you came into my life, God, I have a future. Since you came into my life, I have a future. I have a future. I have a future. Oh, I'm glad I received that word tonight, aren't you? I'm glad that I received that in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. God bless you. I'll see you Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Let's have good church.